Welcome, shalom, welcome to Systems Biology, course number one. My name is Uri Alon, and uh, it's raining outside, so I'm sure some people are going to come in late. Um, I want to start right away with uh, our first feedback loop, biological feedback loop. Because, you know, we're here to learn. Uh, maybe I should say, you heard that I put some music on as you were walking in. So in this course, we'll take care that uh, human beings, students are also welcome. You can come in, uh, you know, living organisms. And we, need, we have s some needs, for example, to help us stay open, relaxed, uh, and learn. And here's one of them. We have a relaxed state where, uh, where we, you know, we tend to, uh, to be more curious, playful, and it's good for learning, right? And when you're in this relaxed state, you have certain physiological characteristics. For example, your, your breath is, is deep. And it turns out that the other arrow also exists. If you take a deep breath, you're might more likely to enter into the relaxed state. So in this course, um, I'll invite you from time to time to take deep breaths. Uh, it's, I'll show you how you, you do it. It's called a deep sigh of relief. You take in air and you let out a sound like this. <sighs> See? So I want to invite you. You don't have to, of course, but if you do, I think you'll enjoy it. Together to take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Good. So I wrote here where we are. We already did this. Um, my name is Uri Alon. I'm a, I've been a professor here for 14 years. I studied PhD in physics. So I was used to systems obeying very precise mathematical laws. Uh, and then a friend gave me a biology te textbook. And this was like a shock for me. It was like re reading a thriller because I saw this matter that was behaving completely differently than what I'm used to. Dancing, these amazing structures created and then destroyed almost magically, working under like very precisely under very strong thermal noise. And I had to, I had to find out how this works. So I did a postdoc in experimental biology. And it's been a discovery every day for me. It's, really fell in love with biology. Um, and uh, the amazing thing is that inside biology, you can also discover, uh, you can say, laws of nature that are as satisfying as in physics, in my opinion. But they're just uh, applied to a different state of being, uh, especially one where evolution, natural selection is at play. OK, and we have another ritual. When somebody comes in uh, late like this, and you're welcome, uh, we take a nice deep sigh of relief just to welcome them because everybody notices. It's just a nice way to say hi. So if you want to, take another nice deep sigh of relief like this. <sighs> and it's not to humiliate, humiliate you. It's, it's just to welcome you. Now, uh, I want to know a little bit about you before I uh, tell you about the course. So I'd like to ask you guys. Here's another person. Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> ah, another one. <sighs> welcome. Good. You're getting good at this. I can hear. Uh, I'd like to ask you guys, how many of you here identify yourself as biologists? Okay, so it's about half. And physicists? Okay, so it's about 10%. And uh, computer science? 15%. Chemistry? Okay, two people. Engineering? Two people. Uh, anything else? Social science, other fields, medicine. Medicine? Okay. So you can speak up. <laughs> Be proud. 
<laughs> what stage are you? I'm sure if I'm a biologist, I'm a, um, I'm a pediatrician. I'm pediatrician. A PhD. Oh, great, pediatrician. How many of you are first year master students? Okay, about a third. How many of you are second year master students? Another third. You guys are welcome. You want to come in? Yeah. yeah. So let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <laughs> How many of you are PhD students? Oh, yeah. Good. So it's about half. And Matt, postdocs? Two postdocs. <laughs> uh, post postdocs. Pediatrician. You're after postdoc, right? I'm PhD. Yeah, PhD. <laughs> Professors. So you see, this is a, what's called a diverse class. There's physicists, biologists, computer scientists, engineers, p uh, clinicians, uh, clinician, you can say, yeah. And that's, uh, that's of course a challenge to, because as you'll see, something simple for you might be really <laughs> new for somebody else and vice versa. But oh, let's take a nice sigh of relief, like four people. <sighs> and there's a lot of space up here in front, you can be, don't be afraid. And I'm talking now about the diversity. So um, in some instances in this class, you can uh, go to learn from each other. Yeah. It's OK. Um, I want to say the goal of this class, or you can say a um, central idea. Whenever you write something or you give a talk, it's very good to, to try to uh, identify for yourself what's the premise, the central idea, one central idea. It gives unity to what you're going to discuss. So, um, so the central idea here is that a, a complex biological systems can be understood using a design principles, I call them. Which are which can unify different, very different systems in a mathematical framework, and the goal is that you will know how to take a biological system and write a model that captures its essentials and understand it, understand it using these design principles, and be able to put it in the context of a wide understanding of biology. We're going to do it. I know that we can because this is the ninth time of teaching this course. And to physicists and biologists, computer scientists, chemists, engineers, and doctors, and all of you can. Of course, it's up to me, right, to, to be clear. It's up to you to tell me when I'm not. Before we uh, start the subject matter, I want to just say, just we're now in, let's say, in the frame setting, the helping you understand what this course is about. To talk a little about the structure of this course, there'll be weekly exercises, and there'll be a final exam, and I'd like, and there'll be also special ex two special meetings for those of you who want to refresh on basic biology, and for those of you that want to refresh on basic math that we need for this course. So I want to uh, give the stage to Jean Hauser, who's going to be uh, one of the metargelim, the two, two tutors. Metargelim. Metargelim, yeah. Hi, so I'm Jean. I'm a postdoc in your RIS lab, and I'll be one of the metargelim. Um, I won't be alone, so you'll get to meet Miri, Asi, um, and Hila and Pablo in the rest of the semester. And we're going to start not on Sundays, as it's written in the time schedule that's on the website, but instead we're starting on Tuesday, March 18th. And depending on your background, there's going to be two sessions. So one is going to be for people who uh, feel like they need a bit of refreshment in, in mathematics about how to solve differential equations. And so Asi will talk to you from 2 to 3 p.m. in Feinberg, graduate school, room C, and we'll talk about the mathematical minimum that you'll need to, uh, to, uh, to attend this class. And then for other people, who are not necessarily physicists, let's just say uh, non-biologists. 
we're going to have another special introductory tutorial about the biological minimum that you will need to follow this class. If you don't really, you don't know for sure anymore what's a ribosome, what is the plasma membrane, these kind of things, come here and we'll have a refreshment. And we'll be at, uh, in Bolson building, in room 17, that's in the basement. And afterwards, from 3.30 to 4.30, there'll be the first tutorial section which will deal with the first uh, exercise sheet that, that's coming out this Sunday. So, that's it. Hope to see you on Tuesday. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, when I say the diversity, just to, to uh, revisit what John said, oh, nice deep sigh of relief. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, you know, oh, I should write this. I should start erasing these leaves here. Some of you know, uh, just automatically, without a delay, the difference between these two words in biology. Transcription, translation, right? And how many of you know this like that? Okay. Some of you don't, don't know the difference between transcription and translation. You'll know at the end of this class. Uh, so I wanted to ask you to be brave and raise your hand if you don't, so I can know. Just to, okay, so it's about, you know, a quarter. On the other hand, some people know by heart, you know, without a millisecond of delay, um, the solution to this differential equation. And some people need to be refreshed, right? So uh, how many of you know, know the solution to this equation just by heart? Okay, so that's half. Of course, I'm asking also to know but what to do. And how many of you need to be refreshed? Don't be afraid to say, otherwise I don't know. Okay, so about 40%, so we have a 10% missing. Uh, here's the solution, <laughs> exponentially decaying solution. But essentially, in the first half part of the course, this is the kind of basically linear, not linear, but first order ordinary differential equations you need to know uh, in the class. That's the kind of level of mathematics. So if you're looking for a course with complicated mathematics, uh, this is not the course for you. If you're looking for a course where you can uh, have intuition about how to simplify complex systems, this is the course for you. So, of course, we'll go over this math in Asi's tutorial here. And transcription, translation, all this stuff, Sean will cover here. All right. Okay, so we've successfully completed the, the frame setting, I would say, uh, unless there's any questions about this part. You can say about the books of the course? Oh yeah, great, thanks. So the book, uh, yes, there's a book. And this book was actually, I wrote the book based on this course. So it's quite close to what I'll teach. The book is called, uh, can you see if I write here? Can you see this? An introduction to systems biology. Design principles <coughs> of biological circuits. Maybe you can't see what I wrote here? Can you see there? <coughs> can't? They can't? So uh, I think there's copies in the physics library and the biology library, at least. And uh, I want to also say there's a resource online on my website, video courses that Itzik was filming in 2011 of this course. So you can see nine lectures there, including this one. Uh, if you feel like... Uh, oh, and we'll put these ones online too, so we're being filmed. Right? Next week, yeah.
It's nice to work with you again. How's my writing in terms of, uh, it's okay? Okay. I try to improve every time. All right. Uh, okay, so we've, I think we completed this. Any other question about the, where, where, are the, where are the movies going to be? So I suppose we're going to put them on, on our website, right? Maybe, Jean, did we plan a course website yet? Yeah, it's ongoing. It's ongoing. And it's supposed to be, so I'll provide the link. But if you go to YouTube and you type Uri Alon, you'll get this lecture from 2011. And you can see what happened to me since 2011. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, a third daughter was born in the meantime. Uh, okay, so uh, let's take a nice deep sigh of relief <sighs> and start with talking about the cognitive problem of the cell. Um. So, of course, our topic this time is to set up the elements of gene regulation circuits that we'll talk about for the first one-third of the course. The course is built by principles. So, uh, for the first third, we'll talk about one major principle, which is that as complex, astoundingly complex as biologi biology seems, it's actually bu built of just a handful of simple recurring circuits that you can understand. That's pretty nice, just like electronic engineering is. And we'll talk about those circuits. And then we'll have other principles, like principles of robustness, how those circuits work precisely despite this, the unavoidable noise inside biology. We'll talk about evolution and optimality. And we'll talk about how patterns are generated when you, an egg goes to a baby, to an adult, body patterns. We'll do all these principles. Let's start at the beginning. So when we talk about a cell, and I'll, I'll talk about you know, all kinds of cells, but my, what I'll say is general to all kinds of cells, usually. But uh, just to be concrete, I'll give an example of E. coli, this biologist's favorite animal. It's a bacterium, a single cell. Its size is about one micron. So there's a thousand of them in a millimeter. And if you just put one cell like that in, a, in a, some water with salt and sugar, after about 30 minutes or an hour, it'll completely duplicate itself, and you have two. And after another hour, four, eight, 16. Then after a day, you'll have, if, uh, if really food didn't run out, you'll have something that's massive, more massive than the Earth. That's Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. You can do the calculation. Inside, uh, inside the cell, you know, what's this? the cell has a lot of uh, miraculous functions. For example, you put some sugar, it, know, it knows when you put in the sugar to make the special machines to take that sugar in and break it down into carbon and build all the other parts of the cell. If you damage it, it knows how to sense the damage and build repair proteins that repair. If you put some uh, food on the side here, it grows these um, electrical propellers that spin at 100 hertz and a computer that tells it where to go and starts climbing up gradients of food or escaping from poisons. Like I said, in, um, so, so it, you know, it comes complete with a lot of, uh, a lot of functions. And what the main uh, parts of the E. coli that we'll focus on uh, that do most of the functions are called proteins. So if I look inside E. coli, proteins, I'll draw them like a Pac-Man because they're almost like living molecules. They're the machines that do things. They're the ones that eat the sugar, pick up the propeller, the ones that repair, the ones that copy the DNA, read the DNA, right, et cetera. Again, if you're a biologist, this is very simple for you. But remember that soon we'll get to some stuff that's not so simple for you, so you need patience. And its size is one nanometer, so it's a thousand of them fit here. And in total, if you look at the cell, there's a, a few million proteins inside there. It's 
packed like this. It's like almost 50% volume fraction of proteins like this. So we have about 1 million, a few million proteins per cell. And these proteins come in different kinds. So E. coli makes about 4,000 kinds of proteins. So you see that if you divide a million by, you know, it's actually a few million by a few thousand, you get that the average number of copies of a protein of a certain kind is about a thousand. But in fact, different proteins range widely from as low as about one per cell or ten per cell to 100,000 per cell. So. Protein concentrations range from, let's say, one per cell to, let's say, 10 to the fifth per cell. When you talk about numbers like this, 10 per cell, you immediately realize that we're talking about low number regimes where there's a lot of stochastic random noise. Because you can't have a cell, all cells have exactly 10 proteins. Some cells will have eight, other cells will have 12, other cells will have 14. So there is random variation in the concentration of each protein. And still cells need to work precisely. So imagine building a complicated circuit that does information processing with this kind of noise. So we'll see how, how you do that. OK, so uh, and when I say the cognitive problem of the cell, what I mean, t uh, what I mean is that the cell responds to its environment. Environment here, let's say it has a chemical environment. E. coli can sense, you know, 100 or 200 different kinds of chemicals in its environment. So it has a chemical space, it has a physical space, temperature, etc. has signals from other bacteria, other molecules from the immune system. Uh, so these are the signals. We'll call these signals. And its cognitive problem is to understand how to change its composition, that is to say, to make the right proteins at the right amount in order to, um, to work well in that environment. Okay. And in uh, response, uh, by making the right amounts of its proteins. So, for example, um, as I said, if sugar is around, it needs to sense it and make the protein that eats up the sugar. If DNA is damaged, it needs to sense it and make proteins that repair the DNA, etc. And the way that it does it, so you can put it here, these are the signals, S1, S2, S3. And here's, these are the genes that encode proteins. I'll tell you that in a second. So gene 1, gene 2, gene 3, gene N. These make up the protein, right? Protein 1, etc., to protein N. It needs to map these. And the way it does it is by building an, an internal representation of the external world. This internal representation so these are inputs, these are outputs. So what's reflected in here about the world uh, is using special proteins, which are called transcription factors, that get an input from a signal. They're special machines. They're built, when they get input from a signal, to change conformation like this. And when they change conformation, they act to increase the production rate of their target proteins. So transcription factor 1, transcription factor 2, transcription factor K gets an input and regulates these genes. 
gets an input and regulates these genes. See? From the, you know, huge dimensional space of outputs and the 4,000 dimensional space of inputs, the internal representation is made of about just 300 proteins. So 300, you can say, internal variables, which is the activities of those proteins, what fraction of them are in this active state. Summarize for E. coli the world and act to change its composition by changing the production rate of proteins. And we're going to try to understand this little computer. I wrote down here, you know, all these uh, biology words that you need to uh, know by the end of this class. Uh, so we're making pretty good progress. Um, I'm going to get into the biology of signal transcription factor gene now. So we're going to go zoom inside the cell and see mechanistically how this works, which again, just uh, hopefully enough details to, that we need in this class. So the mechanism of gene regulation. Inside E. coli is a very long molecule of DNA that encodes all the information needed to build those 4,000 proteins. But in fact, this DNA molecule has something like we know exactly every single letter, and it's, it's a polymer of four kinds of letters. We know all the 4.7 million letters exactly. And they're exactly the same when you call it duplicates. As I say, every 30 minutes, when it duplicates, it also makes a precise copy of those 4.7 million letters. Just think about that uh, accuracy, um, except for rare mutations that we'll talk about. And inside the DNA, there are regions called genes that have the information needed to make a protein. And ne right next to them, there are regions we'll call promoters, which control uh, the amount of um, protein made, or more precisely, the transcription rate. Again, I just want to say something about uh, the precision. So I say gene in E. coli, one gene makes one protein. In human cells, one gene can make different variants because of splice variants. And biologists here know these details, complications. So I'm, as you notice, I speak in a language that I try to not talk about every possible exception. In biology, there's many exceptions, but rather to try to capture like, the, the essentials of it. So if you're worried about that I missed splicing or something like that, just um, that's the spirit here. <laughs> so how does this work? Um, so inside this promoter, there's a region of letters, let's say 20 letters, A, T, T, G, C, C, which is uh, recognized by a protein machine, RNA polymerase. What do we mean recognized? So this protein has chemical surface that can tell those chemical letters, matches them. And when it binds there, can become active, start running on, on the, this DNA, and, co and copy it into a, another polymer a called messenger RNA. And this is what's called transcription. It's like a monk transcribing. It's basically in the same language. You could ask, why do you need this, uh, this step? Right? I'm not going to answer. Just to say this mRNA is like a, it's like a little note that soon will be thrown to the waste basket. It has short life. This one has. Uh, DNA is virtually indestructible and carries the hereditary information. And this RNA is read by the ribosome, the famous protein machine, into making our protein. So this is transcription translation, the difference. So now you know. 
And this uh, sets up a kind of basic rate of uh, transcription. But we want to respond to external signals. For example, we want to turn this gene on and off. That's to say, to stop making the protein, to start making the protein at the right time. And that's where the transcription factor comes in. So this protein, let's say, let's imagine, let's, call, let's, let's imagine this is a protein, like Z, that um, can break, break down uh, a sugar. There's a transcription factor protein. This is the transcription factor that X, we'll call this one Y, let's see. And X can be, as I said, in two conformations, active and inactive. So this 10,000 atom molecule is not a floppy. It's like a, like a machine, two-state machine. And what determines the probability of it being in two states is whether it binds the sugar or not. So it's that sugar that we want to eat that's also the signal here. The signal, SX we'll call it, changes the probability of transiting between these two steps. If it's active, it diffuses in the cell or slides on the DNA and finds out of all these five million letters, one place, let's say, where it has its binding site, let's say 20 base, 20 letter word that again it can recognize and bind. So how does it do that inside this crowded environment, find this one letter, that, that one piece of uh, information that it can bind. And when it binds here, it increases the rate at which RNA polymerase does this, or decreases the rate. So it affects the, the production rate. So I would say that you have this situation where we're going to summarize all this by this symbol, X arrow Y, means that sometimes we add this SX, that X activates or increases the production rate of protein Y. I just want to give you some time scales for, uh, for theoretical considerations and for understanding things. Uh, biology gave us a great gift it's called separation of time scales. This makes life very much easier for us. Separation of time scales, which means that the different processes here occur on vastly different time scales. The transitions between active and active protein conformations occur on the, on the microsecond time scale. And the binding and binding of this sugar occur on the millisecond time scale. So sugar binds and average goes over a thousand transitions like that. So you can talk about when sugar binds increases the probability to be an X star. And this diffusion and search process takes on the order of one second. So again, this is a thousand times slower or a few seconds. So I say order of magnitude, of course, I mean one, ten, one, three, one third second, something like that, around one second. The process of making the RNA and the lifetime of the RNA in E. coli, these processes here, are much slower. So this is about 100 seconds. 100 seconds. Here is, there's, no, there's no separation of time scales between these two. So this is, it takes minutes. Before, when you put the sugar, it takes a few minutes till you see the first protein in E. coli. In, in human cells, it could be, let's say, longer, 15 minutes. Right, so there's vast separation of time. So that's why we can average up, we can, when we talk about the slowest thing, like this pro oh, and the protein, so the changes in protein level, as we'll see in this class, take about an hour. So 10 to the 4 seconds. So there's vast separation of time. Scales. And what we're going to do, we'll be able to take all this part here, and consider it as instantaneous if we're in talking about this changes of protein levels that take place of, on a time scale of an hour. And that's why separation of time scale is so, so useful for, for theory and for understanding biological systems. And now I want to just reflect about this remarkable thing I told you. How did this uh, machinery come to be? 
it, uh, we, we suppose there's not an, an engineer that uh, designed this so beautifully like this. Um, maybe I, just one more sense of wonder about it uh, before I tell you about. So we talk about signals, RNA polymerase promoter, gene DNA, separation of time skills. Um, this uh, machinery is, is almost universal. So genes in E. coli and genes in human beings look very, very similar. They have the same genetic code. I can take a gene, cut a piece of DNA from a jellyfish that encodes a protein that makes the jellyfish green, called green fluorescent protein. And using the tools of molecular biology, glue that to a piece of DNA from E. coli that's a promoter for a gene reg that's, that's regulated by sugar specific transcription factor and put that in E. coli, and now E. coli turns green in proportion to how much sugar there is. That's amazing modularity. Uh, in fact, uh, that's a big experimental tool we use to study dynamics of, uh, of gene regulation circuits, because you can see in living cells the fluorescence output by playing with this uh, modularity. So how, how, how did this happen? Um, By the way, it doesn't work the other way. If you take a promoter from a jellyfish, it won't work inside E. coli because E. coli doesn't make the transcription factors in jellyfish. We'll talk about that a little bit later, and you can reflect on that asymmetry a little bit. And so the, the way this came about, we think, and that's this, oh, let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Welcome. Here, here, there's lots of space, so feel welcome, and is the, the process we think, believe it or not, is by a, a, this biased random walk called natural selection, where every time a DNA replicates, there is a probability to make a one letter error, it's called a mutation, the probability is about 10 to the minus 9 per replication. And if so, if you have a mutation here in the gene, most chances are this protein is going to be malfunctional. And that bacteria is going to have a less of a fighting chance against the other bacteria and make less babies. And that DNA with that mutation will vanish. But sometimes that mutation actually confers an advantage. You make more babies in a, in a certain environment. It's a new environment. And then that DNA passes on and increases, and the mutation frequency increases, and, and then it could even capture the entire population. So that's the process we believe brought about, all, believe it or not, all of these uh, kind of machinery. And that's one of the big challenges, actually, right now in biology is to understand the plausibility of this story of uh, natural selection in detail, okay. how it made this modularity, for example. Natural selection, mutation. And natural selection is, um, just so again, to give you another sc scale about natural selection, uh, if, if you take uh, a small cup, let's say, um, and you put this one, one bacterium in with salt and sugar, and it starts dividing every hour, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to finish up the food, and we know final concentration of bacteria, it stops when it's about 10 to the 9 cells per milliliter, so it'll be 100 milliliters, 10 to the 11 bacteria in the end. And that means 10 to the 11 times DNA was replicated. The mutation rate is 10 to the minus 9. That means at the end, you'll have 100 examples of every possible one-letter change. So for bacteria, evolution can scan a lot of possibilities quite quickly. And what, ha what, what it turns out that happens is that if you look at, let's say, chimpanzees and, and human beings, our genes, this part, very similar, humans and chimpanzees, like 98% similarity, you know, this famous number, right? And so that was a shock for uh, biologists because, yes, where the differences are. It turns out most of the differences are actually here, in these promoter regions, in wh which arrow goes to which gene, this kind of uh, regula regulation. The amounts, w when and where you make the proteins which makes most of the difference between uh, organisms as far as we can tell. Yeah. The mechanism was always the same, or like 65 million years ago it was a bit different? Like if you look at cells and Yeah, what, I'm just curious, why did you say 65 million years ago? Dinosaurs. The dinosaurs, okay. 
So the question is, was this mechanism always the same? And uh, there's some uh, fascinating topic called the origin of life, how, th how things really started from molecules to make the first, so people thought, think there was only RNA, for example, in the beginning. And then uh, DNA and proteins joined in. Sir. But uh, if you when was the first bacteria? Do you know? Do you guys know? Two billion years ago? One billion years ago? Two billion? Hmm? I, don't know, I don't know exactly, but it, you know, they fixed the technology of DNA, genetic code. And from that time, uh, basically the same unity of, of chemistry underlies all, all animals, plants, etc. But there's some uh, unknown about how, how it began before that. Uh, did I answer your question? Dinosaurs almost certainly had the same. No, but the first bacteria that people found had this had similar mechanism yeah. to this. Yeah, definitely. All the creatures alive now uh, had a common ancestor long ago. I don't remember if it's one billion or two billion years. But uh, presumably has the same idea in it. So that's uni it's actually remarkable, again, chemical unity of life. And uh, also evolution accelerates in a certain sense, because it took a billion years to go from bacteria to the first uh, eukaryotes, which have a nucleus, half a billion years to make multicellular animals. And then uh, it becomes accelerating, accelerating. And it only took, let's say, a few million years to go from uh, primate to human. It's a huge change. So it's, there's a sense also that complexity, if, if we define some ways, the rate of evolution is accelerating, kind of it becomes more evolvable. And you can see similar things in technology also. Similar acceleration rates sometimes. And so we'll, we'll reflect on that also in this course. And you know, this is, a very, this is a good time to take a break. So we'll come back at 10.15. Uh, so let's just take a nice <laughs> All right, with this uh, Lou Reed's words, it's such a perfect day. Let's continue to the second uh, part of the first lecture. And so I had some questions during the break I wanted to share with you. One is uh, whether all the, all the lectures will be filmed, and yeah, they will. And you can right now find in YouTube the previous ones uh, from 2011, N nine of them at least. Um, I was asked, uh, why do we need RNA? Why not just uh, duplicating the information and costing energy and resources? Why can't we just read off the gene? That's the kind of questions that um, sometimes when you come outside of biology, you ask these amazing questions. And I, I said, I don't know why we need the RNA. But during the conversation, it emerged that, first of all, it's an amplifier. So it's, you have just one copy of the DNA, but you have 10 or 100 copies of the messenger RNA. So you can make much more protein. So if you need to make 100,000 proteins in an hour, in one cell generation, you, you have to have the, this mechanism. And so um, everything in biology uh, is an invitation to a question. Uh, what we'll do in this uh, 45 minutes is first I'll tell you about the structure of the, the network made of the arrows like this. And then we're going to calculate the response time from signal to uh, reaching the steady state level of the protein and uh, conclude with that. So, um, gene regulation network of the bacteria E. coli is the collection of all these transcription factors that change the production rate of proteins. So we can say X1 regulates X2 and X3. X3, these are usually proteins that do something, repair damage, eat a sugar, build a cell wall. But sometimes there are also transcription factors. And they regulate, let's say, X4, X5. X5 transcription factor regulates, X4 regulates X5, X6. XK, X, so you have um, you have a network. So signal here causes this protein to be made, and this protein causes this protein to be made, etc. So this is a dynamical system that responds to different signals. 
Uh, the order of magnitude of size here, as I said, there's 4,000 nodes, nodes in this graph, proteins, and about 10,000 arrows. It's a directed graph with um, average gene is regulated by 2.5 arrows, you can see. And We're going, to, we're going to really analyze this graph in the coming lectures. And again, see that it's made of a small set of recurring subgraphs, et cetera. But we know, that we know most of these arrows and most of these interactions. We know means there's experiments, for example, you cut out the DNA that makes X, so there's no X anymore, and you put it into sugar, and Y isn't made. Or you purify X in this DNA in a test tube and see directly that it binds there causes a shift, gel shift. So you have good experiments in E. coli for all these arrows, and it's a kind of well-mapped brain. It's a, I say brain like this, of course, not neurons. But it's not like the 10 to the 10 neurons we have, or 10 to the 11 neurons. Does anybody here from brain studies? How many neurons do we have? 10 to the 11. Ten to the 11. This has uh, 4,000, okay, so maybe it's a, it's a good place to start. Maybe I'll make some analogies also with neurons uh, circuits. Uh, inside each neuron, of course, is a network like this, because a neuron is a cell. And we can also talk about the signs on the arrows. So each arrow, we can talk about plus or minus. Uh, plus will um, denote by an arrow, and minus will denote by this kind of arrow, this kind of arrow. Plus, we'll call activator. It increases the rate of Y production. And the repressor, when it binds, decreases it, decreases by interfering with RNA polymerase somehow. So we can ask how many, uh, I'm now looking for a good black marker. Uh, we can ask how many plus and minus arrows are there in the network. So in E. coli, there's about 50% plus and 50% minus. In human, there's about 80% plus and 20% minus. And also, apparently, in neural networks, it's like that. More activation. If you look at a node and you ask about its outgoing arrows, outgoing signs are, you, are correlated, which means X here, let's say, activates most of its targets. It represses maybe none or one or two. Or so. so that's X is basically usually an activator. It's a repressor for some targets. If you look at the in, incoming, which transcription factor is regulated? Because you see, you can have more than one transcription factor binding. Then these signs are incoming. Signs are un uncorrelated. That is to say, genes are usually regulated by activators, repress, and repressors. Neurons also. That's called Dale's rule. Their inputs are their outputs are very correlated because you can have a neuron transmitter that's an act activatory, but the inputs are usually mixed. Um, when we have uh, more than one, if we have more than one input, so if we have x1 and x2 regulating y, we need to understand how two transcription factors integrate or combine at the promoter. And some useful uh, approximations we'll make is x1 and x2, when both, the, both x1 and x2 need to bind in order for the change to happen. x1 or x2, where either one is enough. These both are very plausible situations. So we'll get to that uh, later. Circuits that use these logic gates. And the electronic engineers here, let's, for the sake of the electronic engineers here, which are used to logic gates, take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> 
So this is just about the statistics of this network. Um, some transcription factors regulate just one target. Some of them regulate hundreds. So there's a wide range of number of outgoing arrows. But there's not such a wide range of number of incoming arrows. Genes are regulated by one, maximum six inputs in E. coli. Yeah. And you're saying humans, which is 80% plus and 10% minus, does that include microRNAs or is that just transported? So the question is 80% plus, 27 minus, does that include microRNAs? And this is a question about extra biological regulation where Sometimes the RNA itself, not the protein, has a function and it can interfere with another RNA and ch cause changes in production rate. So here I'm talking about transcription factors, not microRNAs. So there's more, more ra maybe it's a, a point to say there's more layers of regulation. We're talking about the regulation of rate of transcription here. Proteins can also be regulated by the rate of translation, the rate of degradation, many, many, many steps. In E. coli, it's thought that most of the regulation, 70%, is at this level of transcription. But the same principles, because it's fast time scales, you'll see a lot of the, a lot of the math and the principles uh, apply no matter what the regulation, sometimes. Yeah. Why are the proportions different between humans and E. coli? Why are the proportions different between human and E. coli? I don't know. Good it's question. Maybe because most of the regulation is at the transcription level. So we're starting a discussion here. But this year, we already reached to the frontier of knowledge, certainly of my knowledge, but I think, I think in general. So we see already in the introductory class, we can ask questions that take us into the unknown. There's so much unknown in biology. We know the tip of the iceberg. There's a huge opportunity to ask questions and hopefully make uh, meaningful answers, especially these why questions. So in biology, molecular biology, those who have studied it, know that a lot of courses in molecular biology are about the how. How this arginine 156 turns by five degrees in order to bind the how, how, how. Here we're going to ask about why, exactly these kind of questions. Unfortunately, I won't know the answer to most of them, but the ones that I do know the answer, I'll teach you, okay? I, I do know. <laughs> of course, it's a very new field. All right, so, uh, okay, so we're here. And now we, we talked about activator and repressor, and now we're ready to do some very simple math to talk about the response time. So to brace ourselves, let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Ready? Steady? Ready. Okay, and this of course is uh, And we're going to talk now about the response time. So we're going to focus in on one arrow. In the next, next course, we'll start talking about circuits. We'll go for one arrow and ask, we're going to calculate the response time of simple gene regulation. And um, so, right, we have the situation where, just as I said, X binds and Y is produced. You see the series of more and more simplified uh, images I'm making because if we're going to, all the fast time scales, we're going to neglect them, say they're instantaneous, and just talk about the slow time scale. And uh, we're going to write an equation that says, Huh? Should I do it? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to write down the equation. Very simple for you physicists, uh, but it's a kind of a festive time. The first equation for us, right? Don't worry, biologists, you make it. Every and so here, you need patience with each other, right? Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. <laughs> What's written here is very simple. This is the rate of change of protein Y concentration. And it's equal to, the, to its production rate minus its removal rate. And when we're dealing with the situation here, you'll see that production is constant. That's to say the signal is there, X is active, binds the DNA, and production is constant. So let's say beta can vary, I can say can range in the cell. Beta, it, the fastest it could be, the fastest it could be is about one protein per second. About one, one uh, I should say, one transcript, one RNA uh, per second. That's the time it takes RNA polymerase to clear its binding site. And, um, It, I will say beta, it ranges for different genes uh, across 10 to the 4. So there's four orders of magnitude. Okay. And what's this removal rate? So this is like a, you know, like a radioactive decay. It's a first order process. And this removal rate is made of two processes, degradation and dilution. Degradation is the active destruction of Y. So it's an energy consuming process. There's a machine that takes Y and chops it up back to its amino acids. Uh, that's called degradation. And dilution is uh, a reduction in concentration due to cell growth. So if I have some proteins in the cell, I'm not making them and I'm not degrading them. But the cell is growing. Cells grow exponentially in volume. And then they divide in two. By the time they divide in two, each cell gets half. So the concentration went down by half. So that's just a volume effect. And, and I just want to say, this equation describes actual dynamics you can measure with this green fluorescent bacteria I told you about extremely well. So this is not approximation that's uh, very far from what you see in experiments. And I just want to solve it. Well, yeah? Question, yeah. In, in, the, in the degradation uh, rate, what is the time scale of degradation relevant to the time scale of degradation? Uh, just to pause for a second. Sean, would you mind getting me a, a better black marker? The question is, what's the, what's the relative time scales? So in E. coli, for most proteins, they'll say dilution dominates. So the, the degradation, their lifetime is longer than this hour. But there are some proteins that are cut much more quickly. And also in human cells, at least half the proteins, their half-life is longer than the even 24-hour generation time of the cell. 20, 20 hour, 8 hour, whatever it is in different human cells. So dilution is very important. It's usually this. And sometimes this also plays a role. Yeah. Why do we assume production rate is always constant? Why do we assume production rate is always constant? So I, don't, I just want to remove the word always. In this case, we assume that it's constant. And later, we'll assume that it's not constant. But for here, we do some simple, simple calculation. It's good to, to imagine a simple situation first, understand it, and then, um, then you get some intuition about even things that you can't calculate. The question is, is this applicable when the cell is in exponential, its exponential phase? It's only applicable when it's in exponential. Is this equation only applicable when the cell is in its exponential phase? It, this equation is applicable generally. When the cell is in its exponential phase, you have this term, this dilution, quite strongly. When the cell uh, um, is in stationary phase, stopped growing, it still makes some proteins. And in order not to explode, it degrades them. So even the cells that are not growing, they just turn around mm -hmm. until the cell is dead or dormant. Death is like thermodynamic equilibrium, and there's no fluxes. But inside even the cell that's not growing, there's a lot of production and degradation, a kind of feudal cycle. Not feudal, but yeah. So the parameters will change. Parameters will change upon, 
many, many variables. And the, the ratio between dilution and degradation depends how fast the cells are growing. We'll see that in, in detail. I'm going to advance now. So, um, We're going, to solve, uh, uh, we're going to solve this equation now in the situation, in case number one, steady state. There's a question. The question is, what is the unit? Yeah, thanks. So this is concentration per unit time. This is one over time. And this is the unit of concentration. This is concentration over time. So beta and alpha are not different. Beta and alpha have different units. Alpha is a time scale, and beta is concentration over time. Correct. Yeah. So that's why it's a first order equation, and this is eigenvalue. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, because you said this is rate and this is also rate. So ah, thanks. Right. You're right. I said rate and rate. Yeah. So this is a. My, uh, this is, the, again, this, uh, different cultures are meeting, biology and physics. So in physics, you, you wouldn't do that. And in biology, you, you do that. So thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say degradation, dilution rate, and production rate. I'm gonna, just going to keep saying it. And you have to remember that the units are different. Would you accept that? You have no choice, I guess. <laughs> Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> to welcome a new person. If you want to come, don't be afraid. There's a seat here. You can always leave at any time. Yeah. <laughs> and, all right, so we took a breath. OK, so uh, t what is the steady state? Steady state is when uh, things don't change anymore. So beta equals alpha y. And we have y steady state is production rate divided by the, the removal rate. So we need to remember that. And that makes sense, of course. The more we produce, the higher the final level of the protein we have. The more we remove, the lower. That's clear. Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks. Case number two. Um, signal uh, after a long time of being there leaves. So let's say the sugar was there, we made Y, Y is steady state level, and now the sugar is gone. What happens to this protein Y? The signal is gone. So uh, beta equals zero, right? When the sugar leaves, we have no more production. So we're just left with removal. And it equals, we need an initial condition. Uh, we started with the steady state level. And the solution is, An exponential decay. I'm going to plot it out for you. Time, protein concentration, initial condition, exponential decay. I talked about response time. Let's calculate the response time. I want to define it. This comes from engineering. The response time is the time to reach, in any system, okay, in any circuit we're looking at, to reach halfway between initial and final levels. We're talking about the response time. Uh, and in general, we want response times to be fast in biology. We'll call this T1 half. So how we calculate it, T1 half is the time when you reach Y steady state divided by 2. Because that's halfway from where we began to where we end, which is 0. Let's calculate it. So Y at T1 half is Y steady state divided by 2. 
which is equal to y steady state, e to the minus alpha t, and I'm plugging in here t one half. Y steady state cancels out, and the answer is t one half equals one log two over alpha. Because you know you have one half equals e to the minus alpha t one half. We do the log, and remember that log log one half is minus log two. If your your pulse is rising and your sweat is breaking out, you can come to this uh, tutorial. Yeah. Yeah, uh, when I say log, I mean lan. So log here is log base e is lan. Thanks. Now, these questions really help me see when I'm not explaining clearly, so keep asking. Um, what's the point? It depends only on removal rate. The production rate doesn't enter here. Let's do one more case. Wow, this guy, this marker is more difficult to erase. This is a trade off. <laughs> so is it a permanent marker? Hope not. Okay. Case uh, case number three. Can I make the calculation more slowly? No, no. I can't make the calculation more slowly. I can, but I'm not going to make the calculation more slowly. And uh, I invite you to go to the tutorial because I do want to keep a balance between this diverse audience and so. Um, again, I say biologists taking this class have been able to master this math. It's, it's a little you know, awkward at first. Uh, then it becomes, uh, you know, I, I can do it, but it's a lot of effort. And then it's, wow, I can do it with no effort. And then I've just done a calculation without even thinking about it. Or as they say in Zen Buddhism, first there's a mountain, then there's no mountain. No, first there's no mountain, <laughs> then there's a mountain, and then there's no mountain. So this is, this is to encourage you. <laughs> uh, so here, there was, uh, we start from uh, no protein, and then the signal appears. And beta equals zero goes to some, some beta. So what happens here? This is the equation. Our initial condition zero. And with the solution of this equation, it looks like this. It starts at zero. At the end, it reaches y steady state, beta over alpha. And it goes like this. Its initial slope is beta. So if you do the Taylor expansion here, you'll see that it goes, it start, the production rate it starts like beta, but slowly y accumulates until the removal term equals the production term. That's steady state. It's exponentially converging to the steady state. Let's calculate the response time in this situation. time to reach halfway to y steady state. So y, the response time, is y steady state divided by 2, which is beta over alpha, 1 half beta over alpha, has to equal beta over alpha, 1 minus e to the minus alpha t 1 half. So beta over alpha falls out. And we move the e to the minus alpha t 1 half. We do our algebra, and we find the same case number two and case number three. 
when you add, when you make the protein, and when you remove the protein in these two situations, it's the same response time. In fact, in every imaginable situation, it'll be the same response time as long as you go from, as long as beta is constant. So it's zero and then changes, or something and then changes to something else. Because alpha is the eigenvalue of this equation. So the response time doesn't depend on production rate. But this has important biological consequences. For stable proteins, I'm going to show you now, the response time equals one cell generation, which is very slow. So what I'm going to show you now is that if the protein is not degraded, like most E. coli proteins, we're in trouble because time, typical time to go from the initial to the final level, to go halfway, is, you know, E. coli, 30 minutes, one hour for human cells, 20 hours. It's a generation time. And why is that? Because alpha, in this case, is just the dilution. And I, I'm going to explain it now in the case where, uh, for case number two, which is, no production. So if we have uh, some proteins here, the cell doubles in size, it grows exponentially, and then divides into two cells. So if we had, let's say, uh, eight proteins here, after one generation, the concentration goes down by a factor of two. And that's the response time. So log two over alpha is just the generation time. So that's a way to calculate the dilution, by the way. Log 2 over dilution is the generation time. And you can do a simple, similar thing for the case of producing. And so so how, how can you make things fast? Because what does that mean? It means you have sugar. You want to reach the final concentration, beta over alpha, which is the functional concentration of the protein. So suppose for sugar eating protein, it could be 10,000 copies per cell. <coughs> it doesn't help you to have 10 or 100. You need to reach 10,000. So the response time tells you when you reach 5,000, right? That's a, that's a reasonable concentration. It takes you, by the time it takes you, you're already two. You know, it's your d children that get the benefit, or your grandchildren. So you see there's a problem there if you want to uh, make fast responses. So what's a good way to to speed things up? How can you speed up the response time? Is uh, increase alpha, right? So we say let's make let's degrade those proteins. Okay, so to increase. To speed up T half, we can increase the, degra the degradation rate. But what does that mean? In order to maintain that 10,000 protein, that steady state, if we increase alpha, we need to increase production rate. Because the steady state is production divided by de degradation. If we break more proteins, we need to make them in order to reach the same steady state. But then we need to increase production, which has a cost uh, in materials and energy. In other words, if we want to have fast response times in this uh, strategy, we need to make a futile cycle of making and breaking proteins at steady state just so we can have fast responses when we change the steady state by adding signal. 
So that could be a reason why in some cell types you have rapid turnover of different molecules. In biology, you might be thinking of molecules that are made and produced and degraded a lot, like tubulin and like, uh, microtubule fibers, etc., for dynamic reasons. Because if you make and break at steady state, you can change very quickly when you change the steady state. But it doesn't work for E. coli because it's so limited in its resources and energy. E. coli lives in a situation where it has a lot of competition. It has millions, billions of cells around it. If one cell grows 0.001% faster, in a few generations, it'll take over the population. Making a protein, one extra protein when you don't need it, makes you grow one, 10 to the minus 6 times slower. So that's a selectable, actually, pressure. So E. coli saves every base pair, every protein. And that's why it doesn't make and break. It doesn't use this strategy. So next class, we're going to see our first circuit. It's a circuit design, that's to say, some nice thing that evolution built uh, with these arrows that can uh, speed up response times in a way that doesn't cost you extra resources. So let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. And uh, I'll see you next week.